Hello, everyone. Good evening. We are here with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. I'm Cheryl Kippen, the Cultural History Program Coordinator, and um, Evan Bush, Miner and Netherland Mining Museum volunteer, is here to tell us some tales from a miner. And so I'm going to let Evan just take it away and share his stories of mining with us. Thank you so much, Evan. All right. So my name's Evan Bush. I'm a gold miner. I've been doing this for a couple of years now. Um, a couple of jobs I've worked at, I kind of started when I was 18 over at the Cross Mine outside of Nederland, Colorado, and worked there for about three years or so. Did a couple semesters in college, and then went down to White Sands Missile Range outside of uh, Socorro, New Mexico. And we built some tunnels for the military down there for some, from some bomb testing and stuff like that. And then currently I'm over here outside of Salt Lake City, uh, working at Kennecott, Utah Copper. And over here we're uh, adding on to the mine under, underneath the bottom of the pit because they're almost at the, the deepest they can reach with the pit. So we're kind of seeing what other ore reserves and stuff they got going on down there and also a lot of dewatering. So some things we'll talk about today, we'll kind of start with some drilling, blasting and explosives, mucking, slushing, laying rail, timbering and ground support, and then also core drilling. And um, for each one of these, we'll start by kind of the old school method of how this was done. And we'll progress to, you know, what's done modernly. Um, so let's see here. All right. So on the left hand side, you can see there's a set of single jack uh, drill steels. So when a mine was started, the way to progress, you know, tunnels, you know, stopes, any any workings was a, um, you know, miner would grab you know, a uh, single jack or a four pound sledgehammer. And then he'd also hold one of these steels and the steel would be rotated about a quarter turn per tap with the hammer or per hit with the hammer. There's also a double jacking where one miner would hold the steel and one miner would hit it with a double jack hammer, which was usually about eight pounds. This was very slow and took a huge amount of time to drill a hole. Most holes back in those days were probably about somewhere around one foot to six foot deep. And these holes were used to load explosives to break the rock. This specific set here in this photo, I was lucky enough to find outside the cross mine when we were doing some earth moving out there. And what's cool is they're all stamped by the blacksmith. They got little marks on them from when they're made and sharpened and used. And then on the right side here, we have a fairly early uh, air, compressed air drill. This specific drill is made by uh, Chicago Pneumatic, probably made in the 20s or so. I was lucky enough to buy this one and I was able to restore it to operating condition. And I even restored the steel sharpener and sharpened the the steel you see on there, you know, coming out of the drill. And um, the column it's sitting on is from a friend of mine over um, kind of pretty close to the cross. He has a little mine up there and he gave me the column for it. So these drills made advancement of, you know, the underground extremely, you know, much faster than it was before because you didn't just have, you know, one or two miners, you know, um, with their steels, you know, and their sledgehammers, you could have a couple of these drills set up and probably drill out, you know, around, you know, in the, the working phase, you know, the tunnel you're trying to advance, you know, probably in a couple hours, you know, instead of, you know, maybe, a, you know, a shift or, you know, six to eight hours. So 
This is a little bit more modern here. This is what's called a jack leg drill. Um, in the photo on the left hand side, this was a uh, job I did over in Marble. I was building a driveway for a friend. And that's one of the drills I, I've bought and rebuilt. Um, it's a Gardner Denver, which they make pretty decent drills. You know, there are a couple of companies that have come along and tried to knock off some of the original patents and ideas. But the way this drill works is it rotates and it hammers. And then you also have the feed leg, which you can see with the handle. And that's used to push the drill into the rock as it's rotating. And similar to the drill I showed in the last slide, this has the drill steel coming out of the front of the drill. These um, steels are made out of a special type of uh, high carbon steel. So it's flexible-ish. You know, it's fairly easy to bend as steel. And then the bits are made with tungsten carbide. They have tungsten carbide tips, you know, to withstand, um, you know, drilling. And um, usually they last pretty long. There are a couple different varieties of bits, but they last a couple hours. Um, the photo on the right, that's a friend of mine in the cross mine. Uh, that was a drill station we were building for the core drillers, you know, and we were widening it out so they could fit all their equipment in there. And then here, a couple more photos. The photo on the left, that was a mining competition I put on down at the New Mexico School of Mines. And um, it's pretty cool. Me and a couple of guys got to teach uh, people who had never run a jack like drill, how to run the drill. And they're very loud. They're fairly dangerous. And um, they're very, very powerful. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can pretty quickly get hurt. So it was, it was very interesting to teach people that had no experience, you know, how to safely run a drill like that. Um, yeah, so, you know, most of those mining competitions, you have a certain amount of time to drill as deep as you can in the rock. Ours, you know, we, we um, kind of have the same rules, but it was a little more difficult, you know, with people that had never operated it before. And then, the photo on the right hand side that was taken down in New Mexico. Uh, the tunnels we were building were for instrument, instrumentation and then also for, um, they dropped a couple different bombs on these tunnels to see, you know, how the bomb would work in different rock and how well it penetrates different varieties of rock. And this was one of the small instrumentation tunnels. And because we were building these for the military, they had to be within two inches of the shape that they wanted. So we had to be very, very precise and very careful not to, to drill larger than, than they wanted. Here we got a couple of pictures of jumbos. This is what's mostly used today. The jack legs are used in smaller mines where jumbos don't fit or mines that can't afford a jumbo. Um, like I said, jack legs are fairly dangerous. So most places have outlawed them. Like over here at Kennecott, we have no jack legs and we are not allowed to use them because they're dangerous. So the foot on the left-hand side is a fairly old uh, jumbo drill. It's a single boom, meaning it only has one drill on it. You can see there's that hydraulic arm that holds the drill. And they make these in all sorts of different sizes. And this is just to make drilling much easier than the jack leg because you don't have to be right next to the drill. As you can see in the photo on the right hand side, you have a nice air conditioned cab with heating and it's also fairly soundproof and dust proof. So you're not right next to the drill breathing all the dust, you know, breathing all the oil, you know, all that. So the photo on the right is one of the drills we use over here at Canicott. This one has a 14 foot travel on it, 14 foot steel, which means we can drill up to 14 feet at one time. Um, and depending on the ground type and the ground condition, 
Usually the average round or the amount we drill to load with explosives is somewhere between six and 14 feet. And these drills run on diesel. It's diesel powered to move it around. And then there's also a mode where you can run it off the 480 volt mine power. And there's a big spool on the back, which you connect up to the mine power. And then you also connect the, the water and the compressed air to the drill as well. Here are a couple more photos of the drill. This is back in New Mexico. This specific uh, tunnel we were driving was 20 feet by 20 feet. And you can see the outlines of kind of the crosses where we would put the holes. Um, because of the ground type here, I think the average round had about 120 holes or so. And the rounds we were drilling here, there were 10 foot. And um, like I said, you know, we had to be very careful not to, to drill off at an angle, you know, make the tunnel wider than possible, wider than we needed. And then the photo on the right is, you know, a photo to kind of give perspective of the, the drill sitting in the tunnel. And now we'll talk about the explosives we use. On the right hand side, this is what, one of the explosives they use in the old days. You know, when I say old days, you know, probably turn of the century, 19th century to, well, I guess we still use dynamite today. It's a little less common, but it was mostly used, you know, in the 1920s up to about um, 1970s or 1980s when some of the emulsions and the um, ammonium-based explosives came, came around because they're a bit more stable. In that photo, this is a box I found in an abandoned mine. And on the box, it says uh, 1915. So this dynamite is over a hundred years old and it greatly destabilizes over time because it's a nitro nitroglycerin based explosive. So the nitroglycerin will weep out of the stick or sweat out of the stick and it'll all accumulate in the bottom of the box or underneath the box, making it very, very unstable because if you break the crystals, you know, it'll, it'll explode and, um, you really don't know if it's stable or if it's completely inert, you know, after all those years. So you obviously never really want to touch it or mess with it. You know, I was probably kind of pushing my luck to take this photo that close. Um, but it was interesting to see how well preserved it was, you know, being a fairly dry mine. And then on the left-hand side here, we have some more modern explosives. This is what we'd use at the cross mine to you know, blast around. I'll start from the left-hand side to the right. On the left-hand side, we have non-Ls or non-electric caps with their um, shock, shock tube connected to them. And then in the center, we have a roll of fuse. This fuse that burns at 55 seconds per foot. Next to that, we have a roll of deck cord. Then we have the fuse pole and the blasting cap on the very far right. And then underneath we have a, it's a Orica Magnifrac, which is a emulsion and it's a mix of diesel fuel, aluminum and a little bit of, um, sorry, diesel fuel, ammonium nitrate and a little bit of aluminum. And the way we tie this all together would be, we prime the stick, we put the yellow cap and the nano in it, and that cap has a specific timing for the specific hole. And that's done so you can more efficiently break rock with less explosives. Usually the center goes first and the round kind of works its way up from the center to make the hole larger. So you put the, the non-L cap in your stick and then all those yellow non-L cords get clipped into that deck cord. And then that deck cord is connected to the fuse with that blasting cap. And then the fuse pole goes on the end of the fuse. So once you light, you know, that fuse pole, which you do by pulling the little pin and yanking on the fuse pole, you have somewhere around eight minutes or so. It kind of depends on how long you cut the fuse. 
you know, we always try to err on the, the side of safety and cut a fairly decent chunk because fuse isn't very expensive and it always helps to have, you know, a little more time to get back. You know, so once that fuse is lit, we've, you know, everybody slowly walks out. Usually we're about, you know, a thousand feet or so away from the blast. And it's pretty cool to feel the concussion underground because it's all contained and it pushes a fairly decent shockwave. And usually you kind of, you know, stand to the side of the main drift where that shockwave will pass. And you can see, you know, pipes kind of rattle and you can see the, the vent bag, you know, the bag we used to move air in, you know, that'll, that'll shift. And it's, it's pretty cool to be underground with a blast. And then here are a couple photos of the loaded rounds. Uh, the two photos on the left, you can see those yellow shock tubes. You know, they're going into each hole with each stick in them. And then they're all connected to that deck cord with the fuse on the end. And then the photo on the right is the cart we would use to transport explosives. I actually built this cart, um, you know, to be as safe as possible up to all the ATF and the MSHA standards. And one thing that's kind of counterintuitive about having a fire extinguisher on an explosives cart is one of the first things they teach you about dealing with explosives is you're never supposed to put out an explosive fire because it's really not worth it. It could just burn or it could explode. So the fire extinguisher is in case you're in an area where you need to fight a fire, to get away from the explosives, not to use on the explosives. And in that photo, you can see the locomotive we used to pull the, the cars with. Um, it's a 1955 Mancha Little Trammer electric locomotive. I think I have some better photos of that coming up. And then this was kind of a interesting project at the cross. We intersected an abandoned mine and there was a huge amount of dangerous overhanging rock inside of it. And so we had to climb up and carefully tuck these bundles of uh, the, the magnifrac in, you know, the explosive in, um, you know, so we could shoot this and move all that rock down so we could pull it out safely. And we weren't, you know, working underneath it. So you can see there's that in the, Right hand photo, there's that bundle I placed underneath that big log. And this was very effective. We dislodged probably about 70 to 80 tons of material in this one blast with probably about 10 to 15 sticks of explosive. And then our next stage of the mining process is mucking. You know, in the old days, this would be done by hand. You know, you'd have a one ton ore cart and one to two guys loading it with shovels. As you can imagine, you know, that takes a huge amount of time. It's not very efficient. Rock is really heavy. Um, so right, right around 1920s, 1930s, they invented the mucker or the overshot mucker. And this machine works kind of like a front end loader above ground or really any variety of loader. Um, you lower the bucket and slowly drive it into the pile of fresh rock. And you kind of pull up on it a little bit to fully load that bucket. And once you have a full bucket, you swing the bucket next to your head and into the cart behind you. So you run this from the side, as you can see on the photo on the right. That's a friend of mine running this mucker. And you can see the scoop he has there loading in the cart. Usually two guys will run this. One guy running the machine and one guy holding the compressed air hose because this machine runs on a huge volume of compressed air which makes it very loud and very powerful and they usually weigh about 4200 pounds or so so if you ever get it off the rail you know because it also runs on the same rail your carts and locomotive you know run on um if you ever get off the rail you really have to watch it trying to roll over on you because if you get pinned, it, it, bad things are going to happen. You you won't get out of that. Um, I have a couple friends who have gotten very close to this before, and because of that, one of their nicknames is uh, Mucker. 
So, um, yeah, they're they're pretty dangerous. They're not really used that much anymore. Um, they're mostly phased out. Oh, oh, I got it, it's in one of the upcoming slides. They're phased out by a diesel powered machine, which we'll see later. And then these photos, you can see the hauling and the dumping after we load the cars. The photo on the left is the ore dump where we dump all the material to pick it up with the front end loader and either stockpile it or load it out on trucks to go get milled. Uh, these tons, these cars are one and a half ton. And if they're not fully loaded, you know, if you load half the car, it's a real pain to dump it because the weight's not high enough up in the car to be able to hinge it over as they're intended. And usually it takes two guys to to dump the car. In that photo, you can see, I think it's me and Frank um, back in 2018, dumping that out. And then the photo on the right is the full train. Like I said, the locomotive is electric. You know, it's from somewhere around 1955, which makes it really hard to find parts for. Um, you know, usually you have to get them off other locomotives. So we have a parts locomotive and that's the full full train of three cars, which is pretty much at the max that locomotive can handle. If you go over that, braking becomes uh, very difficult and so does acceleration and you don't really have the traction you need to get the train out. So you'll get stuck in curves and you know all sorts of spots like that. And one thing we have to watch out for when loading these cars is we don't load them too high because some tim timbers are fairly low and you can really mess up the timber sets, you know, in the timber in the portal. If you accidentally have a rock that sticks up higher and it wedges between the cart and that timber, and most of the time, it won't ship that timber. It'll derail the cart. And then you have to figure out how to put a fully loaded cart back on in a really low spot, which I've had to do many times and it's really not much fun. And then this is the modern equivalent of the mucker. This is what's known as a LHD or a load haul dump. They're also called a scoop or a mucker. The one on the, the left-hand side there is the one we got for the caribou portal, which is just above the cross. We were rehabbing that to build some drill stations in there and also, you know, so we could treat the water better. Um, that machine is a IMCO 911. It's from about the 70s or so, 60s or 70s. We got it heavily used and I did all sorts of welding on it to you know, fix significant frame cracks and all sorts of other issues. And um, that machine happens to be very smoky because the, the lack of um, diesel particulate filters and stuff like that. So it made it interesting to run underground. You had to have plenty of ventilation so you weren't breathing all sorts of harmful fumes. Um, yeah, and then on the right hand side, that's one of the loaders we have over here at Kennecott. It's a Caterpillar 1600. It's, it has a six yard bucket on it. And for a scale, I'm about six feet tall or so. And that's probably about the height of that cab. These machines are built to be very low and very long so they can fit in very tight spots. And also so they don't get caught up you know, in the back or the, the roof of the mine. Um, these machines are you know, very large and I believe they have up to a 12 yard mucker, which we don't have here, but I think Henderson over there in Colorado may have a couple. Um, we just have the six yards and the nine yards. These are diesel powered and they, you can load a 45 ton haul truck and probably about three buckets or so. Um, so you can move a huge amount of material. I think on average, we're somewhere around 1,000 to 1,200 tons of ore moved per day. And that's with three or four working headings and two muckers and then a fleet of four trucks. 
four hole four hole trucks. And then we'll go back to some more old school technology here. This is what's known as a slusher. Uh, this is just the bucket of it. I got a, a better photo coming up. This is what we'd use, you know, underground at the cross to move material that's not on that rail, because with that mucker, and you know, it's you can't really take it off the rail to move material, you know, to scoop the rock. The way you advance that rail, you know, is fairly time consuming, and so if you're moving rock in a spot that's, you know, parallel to the rail, we would use a slusher. And this is another air powered piece of equipment. It looks kind of like a winch with two cables. One cable is to pull the bucket towards you, and one is to pull it away from you. So you have the tail and the pull rope. Um, this is air powered. And like I said, it's to get spots you can't with that mucker. They're also used in stopes, which is a um, kind of a area where the ore is found that could be inaccessible, you know, um, to the mucker because it's, you know, at a higher elevation or, or something like that. So these are just a really good and, you know, efficient way to move material around fairly quickly. They're fairly heavy pieces of equipment. I think they're usually about 500 pounds to 1,000, you know, for the smaller models. And bigger models are, you know, very heavy and hard to move around. Um, and these are still used today, you know, in some smaller mines. Most mines don't really use them anymore. Um, another kind of dangerous thing about these is if you break a cable, that cable will come flying back at you really fast. So as you can see on the photo on the right, there's that bit of chain link. And usually that's enough to stop the cable from coming back at you and hitting you. But you always have to really watch out for that because they're very sharp and um, they always like to catch you off guard. So now we're on to laying rail, which, you know, there are only a couple mines left in Colorado that still actually use rail. One of which is Ure Silver over in um, Ure. I think they they have 24 gauge rail over there, 24 inch rail, and it's just more efficient for them to mine that way. Most mines are all rubber tire, like we saw before with those haul trucks and the muckers, just because it's more efficient and it's you know it's uh, very time consuming to lay rail like this. And that photo on the right on the left is us joining two sections of rail. Usually the, usually the rail comes in chunks that are about 20 feet long, 15 feet long or so. And you have to join them together with bolts and plates. And um, to do that, you gotta make sure the rail lines up perfectly. So you gotta you know, cut bits of rail and spread the rail apart. And it's, it gets a little bit challenging and difficult sometimes. And then on the right, we have a section of prefabricated track we built above ground and we tied it onto a mini excavator to drag it to the portal so we could lay it underground. Um, this was just to rebuild the rail because um, most of it got destroyed when we, you know, pulled all, when we mucked it out, you know, just because when you're in a very small spot with one of those big muckers, you know, usually the rail will get chewed up and there's not much you can do about it. So that was us dragging that rail back in and relaying some of that rail in the Kirbu portal. And then here's some photos of bending the rail and building switches. On the left, that's a tool called a Jim Crow and it's used to bend the rail. The way this works is it has kind of a big screw in the middle and the two arms to grab the rail. So you you crank it down and it pushes out on the rail to bend it. And then you tap the rail with a hammer, probably, you know, a, a single jack hammer, you know, a small sledgehammer. And supposedly that kind of 
shifts the molecules and helps the rail take its shape once you've removed the tool. You know, I it I learned about that fairly late and it really works quite well, you know, better than you expect, you know, just be able to whack on the rail and have it stay in shape. And then the right hand side, that's a switch I built or you know in the process of building. And there are a couple different varieties, you know, for the the actual part that switches, you know, the point on that switch. Um, there's a variety, you know, like a railroad would use, and then there's also a kick switch, which you just kick the chunk of rail in the middle over to switch, switch directions. And these switches are kind of a pain to build because you have to make sure that the angle is correct and the cart is able to get over that switch, you know, and it's not too sharp for it. This specific one, I made just a little bit too sharp. So getting the cart over it, you know, was a little more challenging, but um, it's not used that often. So it's not too big of a deal. Um, like I said, there are not too many places that use rail anymore. It's kind of a outdated method, but it's, it's pretty fun to get to learn some of those old techniques and, you know, get to see what they're, what they were doing, you know, back in the old days, you know, um, yeah. So now we're on to timbering. And this is another, you know, fairly old technique. And this is to support your ground. You know, usually timber is placed in the portal of a mine, you know, to support the loose ground you go through before you hit that hard rock. These two portals are two I did in the summers of 2018 and 19. The one on the left-hand side is up in Idaho Springs. That was a mine I was contracted to reopen and dug it all out with the backhoe. And finally, you know, got back into that hard ground and built a couple timber sets here. Um, I was lucky enough to be uh, given some, you know, wood from work, you know, from up at the cross. Um, so I didn't have to buy or mill timber, which was quite nice because that timber is fairly expensive because it's usually dug fir and it's eight inches by eight inches and usually about eight feet long, which also makes it quite heavy. And so you can see there, you have the two posts on either side holding that, that cap that's on the top there. And you know, it's, this is a very, very, very strong design. You know, it goes back hundreds of years. And um, this similar style is used underground as well, you know, to support uh, loose rock or, you know, specific areas that are, you know, much looser. And then the photo on the right is pretty much, you know, the same deal there, just from a different view. You can see the boards that you put on top of that cap and the posts, they're called lagging or sometimes lacing. And that's what actually holds back the dirt or the rock. And this is just kind of the most common way of timbering. There are all sorts of different methods and different styles, depending on the ground conditions and the area you're in. And um, yeah, so I've, I've got to do a little bit of timbering and it's it's, pretty fun and fairly satisfying to have everything line up perfectly and get to you know work with that timber and wedge it all together and one thing that makes it a little more difficult underground is you can't just bring in a chainsaw you know like a gasoline chainsaw that you'd use above ground because gasoline is not allowed underground because of how flammable it is so you have to use a air powered or electric chainsaw. And in the old days, they had massive, uh, you know, probably two foot long air chainsaws and they were used to cut these timbers, but they're fairly expensive and, you know, kind of hard to get a hold of. So most days we just use, you know, a, like a DeWalt or a Milwaukee electric chainsaw, or also I think steel makes some pretty decent ones. And um, yeah, so that, that makes cutting timber a lot easier. 
before we got one of those electric saws, we had to use, you know, an old school crosscut saw. And, you know, that is very time consuming and it's, you know, a huge amount of work, but it really gives you an appreciation of what the old timers had to go through to build these timber sets without the modern technology we have today. And then on the right hand side, that's another photo of our train. And we got all that, that timber you know, loaded up there. And it was kind of interesting getting that timber in the portal because there's a couple of really tight turns. So you gotta make sure that timber doesn't catch somewhere and derail the cart and you know, make a huge mess. So you sometimes have somebody in front kind of spotting you to make sure everything was clear. Um, yeah. So now we're on to some other more modern forms of ground support. On the left-hand side, that's uh, what we call shock reading or gunite. It's a process where you feed a dry powder, you know, like cement bags you'd get at Home Depot or something. You feed it into that yellow or yeah, that yellow pump you see there. It, and the way that works is it mixes, well, it, it, yeah, it mixes the um, shotcrete powder with compressed air and it blows it out the nozzle where it mixes with water. And it's similar to pouring concrete like you would, you know, a sidewalk or something, except you're using compressed air to blow it into vertical and horizontal areas. And it's a very good way to reinforce rock and hold loose material in. And it's done, you know, a lot. You know, most, most places don't really use timber anymore. Usually it's shotcrete or bolting. Um, on the right hand side, that's what bolting looks like. You have either a chain link or a hog wire, which is kind of a square panel that looks pretty similar to chain link. And you use a split set bolt. And for that, you got to drill a hole in the rock. And then you pound that bolt in and as that bolt is pounded in, it expands and it re, you know, tightens up on the rock and holds it where you want it. There are a couple other different types of bolts that are used. There's a um, Dewey Dag bolt, which is pretty much a solid rebar and it's encapsulated with a resin. And that resin sets up after you know, a couple minutes and holds that, that Dewey Dag bolt in. And this is all couple different forms of ground support that are commonly used, you know, in modern mines. The split sets are probably the most common. And in this photo, you can see we were putting them in with the jack leg. They can also be put in with a jumbo, but it's a little more difficult. And that specific area on the right photo, that was a um, another chunk of old workings we mucked out. I think we pulled about two to 300 tons of material out of there. And then we went back and bolted it all and secured it up, you know, so it wouldn't be dangerous to go underneath. Um, you know, most mines are fairly wet and usually fairly cold. You know, it depends on the area you're in. Most of the mines I've worked in, they're usually about, well, the cross was about 35 degrees year round, just because of all the snow you know, on the surface and the all the water that would come through the rock, you know, made it fairly cold. Uh, over here at Kennecott, it's usually about 50 degrees or so. It's, you know, fairly decent temperature, um, still pretty wet. But some mines, you know, that are fairly deep, you know, fairly deep down, you know, I'm talking you know, six, 7,000 feet where you're, you're closer to the core of the earth, get extremely hot. I've had friends that have worked in mines that are you know, right around 170 degrees, which is not fun at all. And you can't work in there too long because you'll get heat stroke, you know, and the water is constantly boiling because it's, you know, just so hot down there and you have to force ventilation through to cool things down. Um, here are a couple more photos of some steel sets we put in in the caribou portal. As you can see on the left-hand side, I had to do some welding in there to, you know, secure a spot that was shifting. Um, this portal was 10 feet by 10 feet. And the original one, as you can see on the right-hand side, was 
probably about seven feet by seven feet. And we did a bit more research on kind of the history of the portals they've put in at the caribou, you know, the history of the work they've done on this. And we discovered that in the 40s, they fought putting this portal through the side of the mountain. They fought it again in the 80s. And then we fought it, um, you know, in the last couple of years. And it's just because the ground is fairly loose and we had to be really careful because we we're directly underneath Kirby Road. So we couldn't really make any mistakes, you know, because we could endanger uh, pulling in that road. So we had to be very careful and just kind of go slow and take our time. Um, you know, before we were working there, we had a contractor and they, they messed up a bit because they were working in the winter and they defrosted too much ground and it came through to the surface and all that ground came through. And we came back one day and there was a pine tree sitting in the mine and we were slightly confused <laughs> until we, we looked up above and saw the huge hole that had opened up overnight. So after that, you know, the, we fired the contractor and did the work ourselves and got back into the caribou. Uh, now we're onto some core drilling. This is what's used to kind of explore a deposit or a reserve. In the old in the old days, they didn't really have this technology until I think 1910 or so, and then it was extremely expensive and not very widely used. Um, you know, in the old days, they just chase the vein because usually most gold and silver uh, forms in veins, and that vein can be anywhere from a couple feet to a couple inches. So the old timers would just chase that long. And when it pinched out or ended, they'd chase it, and chase, it, chase it in a different direction or go find a different vein. But because of modern technology, we can drill into the, the earth and see exactly where those veins go. And we can also see the width of that vein. And, you know, with our uh, mine up there, they had a fairly decent core drilling program that Tom Hendricks started back in the 80s. So they had a huge amount of information on where the veins were, which was very helpful because, you know, it kind of provides information that um, is useful for the geologists so they can understand the deposit better. And also, you know, obviously for us to be able to mine it better, you know, and um, actually know if the veins can continue or if it's going to stop. On the right hand side, that's an underground core drill. It's significantly smaller. Um, that one is fairly hard to move around because it's quite top heavy. Um, you know, and all the core drilling we did was contracted out through American drillers or yeah, American drillers. So they brought in all their equipment and I think they did something like 25,000 feet of core drilling. You know, the, fairly decent amount. Um, you can see they used the stations we had to build for them. In these photos, you can see the drill set up and then closer up, there's the control panel. And then this is what the core looks like. There are all sorts of different sizes. Uh, there's NQ, HQ, uh, AQ. Um, and it ranges from you know, about an inch to you know, like six inches. And, most of the stuff they were drilling was probably about, you know, inch to two inch. Um, on that left-hand photo, you can kind of see, you know, some small veins and some, you know, uh, little bits of pyrite in there. And like I said, this is really helpful because we can get this acid and we can know exactly what a certain area will run and where all that vein is. Um, and then that photo on the right is all the cores laid out and you can see the little wood blocks there. And those are to tell you what depth that core is from because usually it's pulled up in 10 foot chunks and you put those little blocks there. And yeah, usually, you know, a box takes about uh, 10 foot of core and it's a fairly hard project to move that core back up. There are all sorts of special tools to you know, go down and grab it. 
and you got to, you know, pump the tool back down with water. And sometimes if you don't grab the tool, you got to pull everything back up and send it back down. And, you know, I got to work with them a couple of days and um, it's fairly hard work, but it was, it's pretty cool to get to learn a bit more about that. And then most importantly here, we got our, our mine cat. Uh, this cat's name is Gur, and um, you know we brought him up because we had you know kind of a mouse problem and a pack rat problem, and he did a pretty decent job of chasing them all away within the first week or so, and he he liked to stretch out under the heater and yeah, good company up there in the winter, so yeah that's that's about it you know let me know if you have any questions or anything I can clarify. All right. Well, thank you very much. And that was great, Evan. So much information. Wow. And I think most of us will agree to let you be the miner and learn that information and share it with us. But maybe we have some, you know, miners out there who would like to do that. We will see. So why don't you unshare your screen, Evan? And then um, I'll, I'll see. We'll put everybody's picture up if they'd like to. And I do see a couple of questions in the chat. So we'll start off with those. So somehow we don't lose track of them. Um, Karen asks, what elements are mined with these techniques that you were talking about, Evan? Uh, so usually it's gold, silver, and zinc in the small vein mining. And then out here at Kennecott, we're mining copper. And that's done in a huge scale because it's kind of a low grade copper deposit. So you have to mine, you know, more of that. Um, but yeah, it's it's usually underground, you know, gold, silver, and then above ground, you know, metals that are a little low grade. Um, so yeah. Yeah. All right. And Ellen asks, have you ever visited mines in other countries? Any significant differences? Uh, no, I've not really had that chance yet. You know, I'd, be quite interested to do that. Do we have anybody who's um, taking part, who's attending tonight, who has um, visited mines in other countries by chance? You can unmute yourself and let us know. Oh, it looks like, oh, maybe Susan. Um, can you hear me? We can, excellent. Huh. Um, okay, I have visited a marble mine in Carrera, Italy. Um, and I've gone to uh, a copper mine in Sweden. Uh, I feel like there's one other, but it's it's escaped me. But those two, anyway, the, the uh, copper mine is one of the, um, it's on UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. It's absolutely fabulous. But it, you know, it's done the old way, nothing new, whereas the Carrera mine was all new. Great, great. Well, I've I've been to a coal mine in Pennsylvania, but I guess that doesn't count. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all we right. visited several mines in Australia. One of them was gold, but I don't remember what the other one was. But they were massive mines. All right, and Sally asks, "What's the deepest mine in the world? Do we know?" Uh. I'm not too sure. I know the Homestake mine over in South Dakota. I think there's somewhere around seven, eight thousand feet to the bottom of that. And currently, they're using it for neutrino research, you know, dark dark matter research. Um, but beyond that, I'm not too sure. I think that's somewhere around the deepest, but I'm, I'm not too sure. I've heard that some of the diamond mines in South Africa. I don't know if they're that deep, but that are pretty deep. Yeah, maybe something for us to Google, huh, and see if we can find. And Sally also says, my husband wants to know how salt is mined. Does anybody know that? Yeah, so I worked with a couple salt miners from Morton Salt, you know, um, that was out in New, New Mexico. And it's mined in big uh, kind of rooms. They have the rumen pillar method, which they used to mine salt, coal, and uranium. So they pretty much just have kind of a, um, a seam of salt, which 
I think out in Morton, it was about 40 feet tall. And they leave pillars every once in a while and just mine everything else. And the pillars are just ground support to keep things from shifting. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, drilling and blasting and mucking it out. Except there, it's tall enough they can have full-size loaders. And um, it's, it's pretty cool to learn a bit about that. Yeah, cool. And let's see, John asks, he says, great job, Evan. He says, do you know what's the status of the cross mine today? Uh, I'm not too sure. I think they're trying to get in production. Um, they've been trying to do that for quite a while. Uh, I know they had some, some water issues and permitting issues and stuff like that. But I think they're slowly trying to get in production. And I guess we'll oh. see what happens with that. Okay. And Mary asks, Evan, something that I asked you the other day when we did our practice. How did you get interested in mining? Well, so when I was in third grade, we were learning U.S. history. And I took a tour with my class of the Lebanon mine over in Georgetown. And after that, I was completely hooked and everything has been about mining ever since, so. All right, very good. And does anyone else have a question? You can just go ahead and unmute yourself and shout it out and put your camera on if you like, but you don't have to, so. Well, I guess I was, I didn't have it sent out to everyone. I was curious how deep is the Kennecott pit now that they have to dig underground. So our lowest level is at 3,500 feet, and the top of the pit is right around uh, 65 to 68. So we're a good couple thousand feet under. Um, and yeah, so their issue is they really can't make that pit any deeper. Back in 2013, they had that big slide, you know, because the high walls are, um, uh -huh. you know, not as stable and um, they really can't go down. So they brought us in to, you know, kind of start mining, you know, underground and um, start pulling out material, which is much high grade, much more high grade material than the pit. And it, isn't that one of the man-made wonders of the world? Like the biggest, one of the biggest pits in the world or something? Yeah, yeah it's the largest open pit mine in the world. Hmm. All right, anybody else? We have lots of people thanking you. Great work. Thank you for your essential work, Sally says. We also yeah, have, so, oh, go ahead. It was, great. it was great. I really enjoyed, you know, working at the mining museum last season was mostly learning about old fashioned mining, but this was interesting to learn more about modern. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming and yeah. And Ellen says, I recommend watching the DVD about Colorado Yule Marble Quarry, our national treasure by Ron Bailey Photography. And she says, that's where the marble for the Lincoln Memorial and Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers came from. So a good tip there, something for us to all look for and watch. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll stop things this evening. Still some more thanks are coming in, very interesting, and I totally agree. Um, I know we've all learned a lot tonight. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it. And if, if anybody does have questions, I can certainly send them on to Evan. So you can always email me if you think of something after this at skippen at bouldercounty.org. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat. And um, then, you know, if you think of something, I'm sure we can send it on to him and, you know, see if we can find an answer. Okay, here we go. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Everybody take care and um, have a good evening. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.